Now let's send this friendly message to the admin here. And then we're gonna wait. Aha, uh -huh. and here it comes. This is the cookie. Developer tools, refresh. And we are logged in as the admin. Now what just happened? So cross-site scripting, or XSS for short, is an extremely common web application vulnerability. In fact, if you look at the statistics from HackerOne, it is the single most common vulnerability reported on their platform. It is also a serious vulnerability, so the bounties are paying quite nicely, averaging about 500 each. Some are lower, but also some are much higher than that. It's also a relatively simple vulnerability to understand, which makes it an excellent choice for beginning bounty hunters to start looking for in bug bounty programs. Cross-site scripting is kind of an umbrella term for any vulnerability that allows us to inject JavaScript code on a page that wasn't supposed to be on that page. It's easiest if I show you a simple example. So here we have a page with a search box and we can search for something here. We'll type in hello and we get this text here that shows showing results for hello. This is what it looked like on HTTP level. So we sent this get request with this query parameter search set to hello. And the server generated an HTML document based on this parameter. So this is the HTML. Now, what would happen if instead of just putting this text hello here, we would put something like this. We would put HTML markup in this text. Then could we be able to actually modify the HTML structure? So let's try that. Let's send another request and this time we'll add something like bolded hello and close the tag and we search and we see that no, we were not able to modify it. Now look at it is showing here as text. It's, it's not showing like as a bolded form of hello, but it is instead showing these tags here just as text. Now why is that? If you now look for it in the response here, you will see that it actually looks a little bit uh, different. This is HTML entity encoded format. And what that means is that we just replace some of the characters that would be used normally in HTML for creating tags and closing tags and so on. And we re replace those with this safe equivalent. So that application wasn't vulnerable because it was doing a very good job of encoding output, encoding parameters in the HTML output. But let's see how this application works. So this looks very similar, but it is actually a different application. So let's try the same thing again. We'll send this hello with this bold attacks and we search for it. And now if we look at the response, we can immediately see that something is wrong here because we submitted this text here, but it's not showing this B tags at all, but it is showing this hello here in a bolded format. And we can of course verify this if we go to the HTTP here, we look at the response and we search for our hello again. Now we can see that we are now showing results for this bolded hello tag here. So we are now injecting into the HTML and this is called an HTML injection uh, vulnerability for that reason. Now, of course, it's not a vulnerability because you can bold some text in here, but there are some tags that are far more dangerous than just bolding text. Like for example, the picture of a cat on the page or maybe we could put a script tag in here. So this is where it becomes a cross-site scripting vulnerability when we are able to do this. So we type some kind of script tag in here. Usually in this proof of concept, when you do for bug bounty programs, you would do some kind of an alert. It's a good practice to use document.domain. Then it is easy to see where the vulnerability is. And now when we uh, open the page, we will see that it is showing this alert. So what could an attacker do with such a cross-site scripting vulnerability? Well, basically you can do anything that the user can on the website. So if it's an online banking website, then you can send the user's money away. If it's a social media page, then you can make posts or add friends or whatever. So you can basically, you would be using the website in an automated way as the user who got infected by your JavaScript payload. 
Maybe if the session cookies are readable by JavaScript code, then you can just read a cookie and send it to the server. This is what I did in the beginning of this video when I sent that evil message to the admin. It contained a script that read the user's session cookies and then it sent those to my server where I had a listener running. And then from that listener, I just copied those cookies, put those in my own browser, and then I was logged in as the admin. And if the vulnerable application happens to be some kind of internal customer support system, for example, so I wouldn't know what to put in my payload, I can still use a dynamic tool such as Beef or the browser exploitation framework to, for example, use the browser as a proxy and then use the application just like I would be logged in on that internal network. Of course, I could do other things like, for example, I could create some fake UI elements on the page that ask for the user's password like, hey, your session just got expired. Would you please put your password here to re-authenticate? Or maybe I would do something like, hey, please download this latest version of our client and run it on your workstation. And another interesting property of cross-site scripting is that it can often replicate. For example, in 2005, there was the famous hack on MySpace where the hacker Sami Kamkar created the Sami Worm that would, uh, it, it had a payload that when you opened it, it would first add Sami as, as your friend, and then it would post the same attack on your wall that would run the payload again when somebody visits their page. So it replicated massively and Sami got a lot of friends also, I think he got probation, so I, I wouldn't uh, recommend that. Now, here are some of the common causes of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. One, not encoding output properly. So whether you have an HTML attribute or you're inside an HTML tag or you have a JavaScript string, it doesn't matter if you're not encoding properly to the context in which you are working in, then you will have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Two, putting parameters in the wrong places. For example, if you put a parameter in an HTML attribute and then you forget to quote the attribute, then no encoding in the world is going to save you. You're going to have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Three, what you see is what you get editors. So these are basically HTML editors that you expose in a web application to the end user. And the end user is going to use the editor to put some bolding and some colors and then submit that. Then you save it to the database and then you will render that content on the website without any encoding because otherwise it of course it wouldn't work. So you have to rely on HTML purification or sanitization and if this is not done right then you're gonna have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Four, using JavaScript unsafely. So if you take some parameters in your JavaScript code and then you write those directly to the DOM then you're going to have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Also if you take those parameters and then you execute those parameters with something like evil then you will also have a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Five, using JavaScript libraries with vulnerabilities like for example if you have an outdated jQuery or outdated bootstrap or something like that then you can have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities because of those libraries and six unsafe file uploads so if you are allowing users to upload HTML files or SVG files or other web capable files under your web root or you are just serving user submitted content back and you're doing it wrong then you're going to have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and number seven, allowing JavaScript URLs in your application. So for example, if you have a link sharing website and you allow users to put in links that have the href set to JavaScript colon something, then having somebody click on those links is going to execute JavaScript code. In general, there are four types of cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and they are not mutually exclusive. That is to say, one vulnerability can belong in one category and the other. One, reflected. So reflected XSS means that the injected JavaScript code is going to be reflected back right in the HTTP response, but it's not stored on the page anywhere. To find these bugs, you would just find out what parameters can you input to the application and then find those in the HTTP responses. And when you find that some parameter is reflected, then you will just try, is it getting encoded properly? So you, you would try to submit things like smaller than or larger than if it's inside a tag, or you will try to 
submit quotes if it's inside an attribute, single quotes if it's inside a JavaScript string, and so on, to stored. So stored means that it will be saved somewhere on the page. Like for example, you submit some content, the next time you refresh the page, it's still going to be there. So these are usually much more powerful cross site scripting vulnerabilities than the reflected ones because sometimes you can infect the entire website and all of the users who see some post maybe that you put on the website are going to be infected by your JavaScript payload. And looking for this stored XSS box is pretty much the same as with looking for reflected ones, except that you first have to figure out for which pages your input is getting reflected on. One thing that you can try is to just put these kinds of payloads everywhere and then just browse the application and hope that on some page one of the payloads is going to fire and you will see an alert box. And the third kind is DOM XSS. And what this means is that the vulnerability is not happening on the server side when the server is generating HTML, but it is happening on the client side, on the browser side during JavaScript code execution. So for example, you may have JavaScript code that is taking some parameters maybe from the URL bar, and then it is using those parameters to construct HTML on the fly. So it would be modifying the DOM on the fly, and if it is doing this unsafely, then that would be a DOM XSS. Also the case where the JavaScript code would be executing something like using eval or set timeout or set interval or some other function that is just taking in a string of JavaScript code and executing it would also be classified as a DOM vulnerability. And basically there are two ways in which you would look for these bugs. One is that you can use the developer tools to just monitor the DOM, see if something weird is happening to it. And the second is that you would need to read the JavaScript code and understand it and debug it. And that will of course take some understanding of JavaScript, but that's the way it is. Of course, there are some tools that can assist you, like for example, if you have Bird Suite Professional, then that can do some analysis on JavaScript code as well and flag you some vulnerabilities or possible vulnerabilities. And the fourth type is blind. So blind XSS means that you will not see your payload fire. For example, let's say there is some internal customer support system, then maybe you can send some support ticket to the system through some web application, but it will be some uh, customer support personnel using probably some internal application on some internal network who is going to be actually firing your payload if the application is vulnerable. And to look for this, you need to have some kind of a listener, some kind of a backend server who is listening for connections from the payloads so that you will know when they fire. One thing you can do is to use this tool called XSS Hunter. It has this web UI where you can copy payloads from and then you will send those payloads and whenever somebody would trigger those payloads, then XSS Hunter will trigger its own payload, which is going to screenshot the page where the payload fired and take the HTML and the parameters and stuff like that, and then it will be easy for you to see where exactly the payload fired so you know where you found the vulnerability from. So finally we have reached the most important part of this video, how to prevent cross-site scripting. The most important, use a modern UI layer. So you have basically two options. The first option is to use a templating engine for generating HTML. So instead of doing it the old way of just mixing code and HTML together, you would have a template. And for this template, you give the parameters that you want and the templating engine will then construct the final HTML also automatically encoding the parameters when it's doing the construction. So you don't have to worry about manually encoding every single parameter because that doesn't scale very well. And the other option would be not to generate HTML at all, but instead use a JavaScript UI for your application like React or Vue or Angular, for example. Two, use a content security policy. There is no cross-site scripting vulnerability in the world that could not have been prevented with a good content security policy. So what CSP is, it's an HTTP response header that is sent from the web server to the browser and it tells the browser what kind of resources can be loaded on the page and what can they do. And the most important thing for XSS is that you can say, we can only execute scripts on this page that are loaded from our own domain, or we can only execute scripts that have this specific hash. So you can restrict what kind of scripts can be executed on the page. And if you do it properly, then even if an attacker would be able to inject some JavaScript code onto your page, the code would not execute. 
3. Don't put parameters in the wrong places in HTML. OWASP has a really good cheat sheet about what are the bad places to put parameters. I will put a link in the description for you to read. 4. When you're building JavaScript code, never put anything that can come from a database or user input or anywhere that is non-static into any function that executes JavaScript code or modifies HTML code. 5. If you have links and you want your end users to be able to put links on the page, validate those so that the links cannot have something like JavaScript colon evil stuff. 6. If you need to show raw HTML on the page, then make sure that on the client side, before rendering that HTML, you would run it through DOM Purify to make sure that it doesn't have anything malicious. Additionally, render that HTML inside a sandboxed iframe so that the iframe will not have access to anything on your page really even though it is visible and also you can give that sandbox some rules like for example don't execute any JavaScript code. And seven, if you serve any user submitted content back from your application then make sure to serve that with the content disposition header set to the value of attachment. Then the files will be downloaded by the browser instead of open in the browser. Thanks for watching. This has been preview content from Hacking Academy. If you haven't already done so, go to hackingacademy.io and sign up. If you like the video, then leave a like and don't forget to subscribe. Happy hacking!